Well, welcome divas to our nutrition class. It's January 11th and we are into the new year and we are launching into a new series uh, that is very dear to my heart. Um, we are going to look at fitness and some of the some of the questions around fitness, how much is the right amount? You know, does it matter in our immune system building? Does it matter in our overall health and wellness? And most of us would of course say, of course it matters. Nutrition matters and so does fitness. But um, I really want us to dig a little deeper and understand what, where are the boundaries? You know, how much is too much? How much is not enough? And so I really want us to dig in uh, with our science caps and really understand how does it matter to us, both in the stage of life we're in, uh, given our, our health circumstances, you know, how do we delve in and get the most out of fitness? Um, we know our bodies are built to move. Um, we know our bodies are not built to sit. Um, and actually, Elaine, I love your comment when you came in this morning, and that is that you you lose weight in the kitchen and you build health and strength in the in the gym, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to try to help us do in the next several weeks is really look at those details and understand um, what it all means. And so what I want to go over today is a couple of sites. Hello, ladies. Welcome. So glad you're here. Um, so I want to give you some resources. I want to show you some of the websites that I really love, um, just like we always do, you know, looking at where is some uh, viable resources, how do we decipher good information, and, um, you know, really understanding how do we make the most out of our information base. Because I don't want you to think that, you know, Suzanne Ryman has all the answers. Um, but I do want to start putting some good questions uh, to pique your curiosity. Uh, so first, a little background of me in case you don't know. Um, I, at age 13, I fell in love with movement. And so that early on, I couldn't stop running. I got my first pair of Nikes. They were neon green and I ran. And from that moment, I couldn't stop running. It felt so good to move. Like exactly. I just, <laughs> and so now at, you know, 56, I still love it. Um, this morning I was out running with my dog and playing and, but you know, over all these years, the way I have exercised has really been different. I always loved the idea that you could move to music. I love the idea that it makes you feel exhilarated and alive and it makes you breathe. And, and then I think of Oprah Winfrey and she, you know, went on camera and of course she's, you know, loved by the entire world that she announced that she hated exercise, but she decided to white knuckle it and do what? You guys know? She yeah, she hired trainers for sure. She did a marathon. Oh, yeah. I mean, she just decided to kick it in the face and do the hardest thing out there, she yeah. thought. Um, and so there's this wide range of how we interact with movement. How does it make us feel? Are we burdened with exercise, the expectation of what we should do when? Are we burdened with, um, you know, having to follow a certain plan? And so, you know, through my my young adulthood, I loved to bike ride just for fun. I would, you know, do 30 miles. I was really always by myself. My girlfriend said I was crazy. Um, but I loved the way it made me feel both begin at the beginning of the exercise, during it and after. There was these different phases of euphoria that I probably was addicted to. Um, lots of my family members had addictions to alcohol and cigarettes while I had exercise. And um, I wanted to have a career in fitness. And so um, my first degree in college was uh, in exercise physiology. And I loved learning how we can take a sick body that has cardiovascular disease and help them get stronger and more independent and have to take less medicines if we in fact get their bodies strong. So how cool is that, that you know, and that we could actually do that? And um, maybe halfway through my, my college uh, career, I decided, you know what, with fitness, you gotta have one more piece of the puzzle. What do you think it is? Nutrition. Exactly, nutrition. And also kind of the pragmatic side of my personality I said, also how am I gonna be able to make money? I'm, I don't wanna be a coach. 
I don't, even though I love teaching aerobics, I don't think I could do that my whole life. So I went in on to change my degree in nutrition and got my master's as a dietitian. And, you know, I was still kind of the only one in the group that was a dietitian that loved fitness. Thank goodness that is changing. I have lots of dietitians that come through not only Powerhouse Bakery, but that I meet in, um, UTSA and of course at UC Davis, which is where I went to school. And now more dietitians are figuring out that fitness is really important. Um, but you know, we always have this scale. Which one's more important? You know, you hear different things. What have you heard about fitness and nutrition for reaching the pinnacle of wellness? What what do you think is the most important if you had to pick one? Nutrition. nutrition? which is probably why you're here and not doing the Pilates class with the divas. <laughs> um, well, and I don't want to say that there's a right answer because there, there really isn't. Um, it, it depends. It depends on our health and it depends on our bodies. And so um, what I want to kind of play with today is some of the fact or fiction that's out there. And, you know, we hear that if you want to lose weight and most of us in this room are women, if you want to lose weight and, you know, be successful in society, you have to have a certain physique. And with that, you must do the E word in order to get there. Right? Fact or fiction, if you want to lose weight, you need to exercise more. How many of us believe that? Why? Nobody's raising your hand. Did I, did I plant that seed or what? Um, well, and so what we're finding is that it's just not that simple. If we think about how many calories are in one pound, anybody know? Yes. 3,500 calories equals one pound. So if we exercise for an hour, how many calories do we burn? Oh. <laughs> Not by a long shot, baby. Well, and even more interesting, so, so now I've, you know, we'll use my example again. Um, I taught uh, aerobics since I was barely old enough to teach. She said, no, you cannot teach aerobics at 14. Uh, you can take the class, but we cannot pay you until you're 18. So I finally got to 18. I took my, you know, certifications. Okay, now can I do it? You know, and so I love the idea of getting paid to work out because, you know, that's like perfect. But back in the 80s, which is when all this happened, um, we were all into trying to get this physique. And we learned in those very first aerobics classes that if you work out for how many minutes? What was the, the what's the typical amount of time you're supposed to exercise? Something like 45 minutes, you know, to an hour. Cuz most classes, how long are they? An hour. So we've got this expectation that we've got to work out an hour. Now, do we, do we have a little gadget that we wear on our wrist that tells us how many calories we're burning if we're exercising? Yeah. We do now, right? In the 80s, we didn't. But I learned this thing called perceived exertion. Um, so RPE, rate of perceived exertion, is kind of, you know, before the times when you had your fancy watch. Now, when I worked at Lifetime Fitness as a personal trainer, we also used RPE. Anybody ever work out at Lifetime Fitness? Yes, that's why. I'm so glad you're here. So, Elaine, do you remember what's in their, in their aerobics rooms? There's a big chart on the wall. And there's going to be a, uh, a yellow zone. And there's going to be green and red. Does that ring a bell? Sort of. Sort of. It's talking about heart rate range, and it's trying to help us understand if we're working somewhere in this range of heart rates, are we doing what we're supposed to do, which is get healthy from exercise, right? Because we are all there to actually lose weight. But we also, you know, want to live in the, under that halo of, well, I'm here to get healthy. <laughs> and so we're always talking about uh, how we're going to do this healthy paradigm. And so where I'm going with this is part of our healthy goal is weight loss. But now think of if you've been to an exercise class and you've been going to an exercise class more than maybe a couple of months, do you see everybody all of a sudden losing a lot of weight? Yeah. 
No. Why is that? So, so when we look at just the exercise idea, we have to understand that there's a time and an intensity correlation, right? Mm -hmm. So how long we work out and how hard we work out has this, this, you know, secret combination that will help us get to what we think is our ultimate goal, which is weight loss. It's just not that simple. So let's just say a guesstimate. Let's say in our hour of exercise, we go to an aerobics class. Anybody ever take an aerobics class? Yes. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, what kind of exercise have you done? You want to share? If you haven't done a formal exercise class. On machines. Okay. Okay. And Tai Chi. Ooh, cool. And yoga. So the yoga is also about an hour long. So that's kind of, again, this little paradigm that we've decided. It's also, you know, kind of how long do people want to spend somewhere? We all live in hour blocks. Let's just say that too. So where I'm going with this again is that there is a, a level of exertion that burns a, ma- a certain amount of energy in a certain amount of time. And if we think of a given hour and we're working out what we think is, you know, medium hard. So yellow would be easy. Green is medium and red is hard. When we're looking at heart rate and we want to be in the green range because if it's too easy, we're not burning enough calories. If it's too hard, well, that's just too hard. We don't want to do that much. And if you haven't been in in the aerobics classes, you know, then it it might not make sense to really talk through this. But let's suffice to say that we're trying to get some kind of idea of how hard are we working and how many calories are we going to burn. So in a typical aerobics class where we're going to get, um, we're going to work out medium hard, what are some of the symptoms we feel? Well, we feel a little bit of sweat. We start breathing hard, right? Breathing goes up. Do we feel, what else do we feel? Well, you might feel some um, muscle, um, like fatigue. fatigue. Yeah, like fatigue, like our muscles are going, um, I'm done. Can you please stop that? So that's our body telling us, that's giving us some feedback of, this isn't healthy, quit that. That's hurting. If we put our hand on something and it's too sharp, or of course if it's hot, and our body says, quit that, it hurts, we stop, right? But in exercise, we say, oh, no, 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 no. We want to get stronger, so you just, you know, knuckle it, get through it, get through your set on the exercise machines, go one more mile, go a few more minutes, get through our goal. Because our whole idea is we don't want to listen to that body cue. We know that if we go to a certain point, we're going to burn some calories. Now, the, the tough thing is, so say we, we burn, you know, maybe 300 calories. If anybody's ever worn a watch that tells you how many calories you've burned, is that too far off? No? It certainly does. So your, our, your rate of perceived exertion, of course, is going to have it. Because remember, we always think of the intensity of the intensity and time. Those are our big X, Y axis. How hard is it? And how long are we doing it? So you're right, Rachel. It, of course, depends on what you're doing. Really, the whole point of this is that we're going to burn somewhere around 300 calories. In the context of it takes a whole lot of those hours to exercise in order to actually shed a pound, right? So if we go to the next thought and there's one hour in our day, what are the other hours in our day going to look like? Oh, we have to talk about that. (laughs) So we have 24 hours in the day. And how many hours do we sleep? If you're being good, it's somewhere between eight and 10 hours. And we figure we're gonna get ready. Maybe we're gonna work for eight hours. What's left? Eating. Eating. 
So there we go, eating and food prep. Maybe being nice and talking with our family. So you get the idea. There's this one little hour of exercise. So if we burn 300 calories in this exercise, how are we ever going to burn 3,500 to get rid of one pound? Eat very healthy. <laughs> Eat very healthy? Stop eating. <laughs> and you'll also maybe know that people can eat a very small amount. If you've heard of somebody following a 1,000 calorie diet, do they immediately shed all kinds of weight? No. They don't because not only is there a factor of a lot of other things happening in our day besides this one hour, we also know that our, our, our body takes a certain number of calories. Body to stay alive burns basal metabolic rate. So just doing all of these things our body has to burn a certain number of calories. And then we, we increase it a little bit with the calories burned in an exercise. Anybody have an idea what their basal metabolic rate might be? What do you think it I is? Know. Yeah? I mean, if I'm using the calculations that you're doing. Yes. Uh huh. If, if I do nothing all day but sleep and breathe, I would need 1,500 calories. 1,500 calories. So basal and metabolic basal. rate. Baseline. So what do you think has a bigger input? Um, just keeping our body alive or one hour of exercise? Right. So now the whole argument would be, awesome. I don't really need to exercise. It's just not worth it. 300 calories is not going to make a difference. I might as well rest all day. Right. And then there's another calculation that looks at respiratory quotient. And I won't get into the detail too much other than if we measure what we exhale, there's a certain ratio of oxygen and, and carbon dioxide that tells us how much fat versus sugar we normally burn in our body. So again, I don't want to get too much sciencey, but we are going to investigate this over the next few weeks because I really want you to go, oh my gosh, that's so interesting. What I'm hoping throughout this series is you're going to see that it's definitely not as simple as the harder we work, the more calories we burn, therefore we're going to lose weight. So that myth on your paper is the one that I definitely want to attack right now and say it is fiction. Fiction. Coming from the exercise enthusiast, all I wanted to do was work out. I was totally addicted to and loved it because of the way it made me feel. Now, we can follow that bunny trail and go, you know what? Part of this wellness paradigm does have to do with how good we feel, right? We've talked a lot about how our, um, our immune system, our body, the uh, enteric nervous system, our neurochemistry, all has a really important bearing on our health. And so if we've got a lot of happy hormones going around, is that going to help our immune system? So if we love going to yoga and Tai Chi and the weight training and we have camaraderie and we have just some good times, does that burn calories? No, but it sure does start to put something around this. Now, the, now what happens if we go to a yoga class and we burn some good calories and we come up together with friends, we have all these feel good endorphins going and then we go to Starbucks and we all have a double frappuccino and a... Cinnamon roll instead of going to Powerhouse Bakery. No, I'm kidding. So you can see that there's so much more in this puzzle piece than just looking at calories burned. And you probably knew that intuitively, but it's a really dangerous rabbit hole to get into to think, well, I just have this extra weight because I'm not exercising enough. And that's what I, the myth that I want to get rid of right now. There are people that s decrease their exercise and start losing weight. Now, granted, some of the weight that we lose is going to be some muscle mass. Because look at this. When we think of what our basal metabolic rate is, this is determined 
by our body composition. So if we laid in bed all day long and didn't do anything, what are we going to lose? Muscle mass, bone mass. Are we going to lose fat mass? Probably not, but a little bit. Well, a little bit because you're not going to be eating as much and your whole metabolism starts to slow down. What tissue is more active in our body? Is it muscle, bone, or fat? What muscle, what tissue is the most active? Yes, that's an easy question too, right? Easy answer. So we know that if we are really active, we are going to have more calories that we burn while we sleep, while we work, while we food prep and play, and while we exercise. So, so while Elaine is muscular and she's done a lot of exercise, her calorie burn is going to be higher than my calorie burn. She's taller. She's got more bone mass. She's got more muscle mass. Of course, she's going to burn more calories. Is that going to mean that she's going to have an easier job losing weight? Sadly, no. It just depends. So we understand that there is a calorie balance equation, which I've talked about in my videos. So there's a little piece of the puzzle that says, okay, we're going to just look at numbers. And we are going to say, if you eat 1,500 calories, here's the calorie balance equation. And we say calories in, if they're greater than calories out, what happens? Calories in or more than out, we're going to fat. Right? If calories in are less than calories out, we're going to get skinny. It's not even that simple, right? Because we know that people sometimes eat more calories and they still get skinny. There was a whole um, school of thought back in the 80s when, uh, again, I was kind of deciding what I want to do in this world and how do I want to serve my Lord and be, you know, somebody that's going to help people with health and wellness. And I was working at the longevity, the Pritikin Longevity Center. They have a beautiful place in Santa Monica and I'm from California. So I got to go down there and my, my office would be looking over the beach. And I was like, dang, how could I say no to this? And ultimately I did. Um, but their whole premise was if you eat more of this kind of food, you will lose weight. What kind of food do you think I'm talking about? <laughs> oh, you're so smart. Plants. Well, and so when we think of plants, you know, we think of mass. Okay, you know, it's all that fiber and all the fluids in the foods. And of course, it's going to look like more, but it's really not more calories. I go to a Chinese restaurant and I eat their, you know, uh, chicken and vegetables and I'm hungry again right away. Have you, do you, have you heard that before? Yes. Why do you think that is? Because our body um, breaks it down a lot faster. Could be. Yeah, faster. Because there's not as much fat in it. And our bodies are used to having more fat and more protein that does stay in the tummy longer. And, of course, it's going to make us feel fuller longer. Um, but have you, how many Chinese people have you seen that, granted, eat rice all the time, and that's one of those dangerous whites. How many Chinese people have you seen that are fat? And they eat all that white stuff. Well, even what's used to a Western diet. Exactly. Yes. If if they stick around us long enough, they'll get there. <laughs> right? They'll get there, but they're not there yet. So the calorie balance equation sometimes makes sense and sometimes it just fools us. And so that's the other thing I want us to really think through. How do we understand how this calorie balance equation works? Because Elaine said, okay, my basal metabolic rate is 1,500 calories, and I know I'm going to work out, so I'm going to take off 300. Now I've got 1,200. Well, cool. If I do this long enough, that little uh, less than my, my needs, I should see a decrease in the weight. Now, when we start exercising, what happens to our appetite? Sometimes activity will increase our appetite. So that could be a reason. 
Also, there could just be so many other things wrapped around the fun and enjoyment of exercise. I used to do these long bike rides and I would pack my, my backpack with all my fun foods and I'd have a picnic out at the cheese factory and I'd have all this great stuff. And then I'd get home after my long ride back and have to make some more food. You know, it's, you almost feel like you've now justified eating more, right? And then there's the almighty protein powders, the shakes and all the things that I deserve because now I'm an athlete. And so, <laughs> right? I deserve this. I need all my protein bars and my protein cookie because I need all this protein and now I'm going to make my extra veggies because we know plant-based is good. So now I have the best of both worlds, all the meat I need and all the veggies I should eat too. And your calorie balance equation starts to get a little off because you're not just focused on a plant-based diet. You're saying more is better because now I've got to fuel my more muscles. And of course, we always hear that muscles need protein, which is certainly true. What are, what are muscles made out of? Amino acids. And where do we get amino acids? Yeah, from, from animals or plants. So we take the amino acids from whatever we're eating. We ingest them. We break it down. Our body says, okay, let's rebuild some of those amino acids and build your biceps because you're he lifting those heavy weights. Let's use some more amino acids, put them together, make your thighs stronger, and, of course, your heart. So, yeah, we just take the amino acids and we rebuild what we need. Of course, we know that plants have amino acids, just like animals. So we know that both get us the end result that help us build our bodies. It's just a question of how much. And so you've probably heard me talk about the, um, the different epic movies that have been out and the one that really looks at the athletes, um, you know, that kind of shattered the whole paradigm of you need so much animal protein. So if you haven't seen those, I want you to look at them because I think they're really interesting. So what I, I wanted you to be able to look here, and we can kind of share this together now, is the Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies. So he's, this is one of the sites that I really like. And when I watched um, The Game Changer and you've seen Forks Over Knives, it, it really put a whole dent in my armor that said protein is absolutely critical for athletes, including me. I, I was, I'm a black belt in karate and muscles were important. If I'm going to break boards and, and take down people the size of ivory, I better be strong, you know? And so I better drink, eat lots of protein. And when I started having, um, I had back surgery and so I had uh, a long recovery time and then I just decided, you know, maybe I don't want to go back to karate. I, the idea of being thrown again is probably not my favorite. But I still want to be strong, right? But then I went through this whole transition of, I actually feel so much better decreasing my exercise. My mass decreased. All of a sudden, I felt so much better. I, I could move better. I didn't have nearly as much decreased range of motion because I didn't have so much muscle mass. If you think, I mean, it's hard to probably picture, but I, I lost probably about 12 pounds of muscle when I was at the height of my training to now. So, you know, 112 versus 100 is a big difference on someone that's, you know, not even five feet tall. So when we think of how can women um, really stay active and how does diet get involved in that? So Colin Campbell is just a great resource. Um, this is one of the articles that I wanted to share. And, it, you know, you can read it on your own, but it's a very interesting one. And it's really talking about how by staying active, you have all these benefits. Weight loss, gain confidence in your body image, uh, reducing the aggravating menopause symptoms, reducing anxiety and depression, improve sleep quality, reducing inflammation that's associated with pain, increasing energy throughout the day. Um, and what I love always, always is there's some really great references. And so the National Heart and Lung and Blood Association, the American Dietetics Association, even Science Daily is a pretty good one, are the resources where we're getting the data that gives us the summary of this, um, of this article. So I thought it was, it was a really good one. Um, the other one, let me see if I can go up here. 
This one I printed for you. Actually, Jose was kind enough. So if you haven't heard of the Physicians, Physicians Committee on Responsible Medicine, have you anybody heard of this group? When it looks at a healthy diet and lifestyle, um, of course we know that veggies is important. Look at this, front and center says eat more soy, period, to, to reduce your risk of breast cancer. So again, that whole uh, paradigm shift is happening just like with exercise and animal protein, we're seeing a paradigm shift of cancer prevention and phytochemicals that have a rich source of phytoestrogens. Um, so of course we know avoiding processed meats and increasing your use of nuts and seeds are so important. Um, and here's that whole wonderful topic of exercise regularly. And so when we look at that idea, being active lowers the risk of breast cancer, uh, not only weight loss, but also to make it harder for tumors to grow and even boost your immune system. So being active is unequivocally an important component. And now I wanna hear from you guys. How are you being active? Anybody wanna share? What kind of activities are you doing knowing, because I'm sure this is not the first time you've heard that exercise is something that's valuable specifically for um, the post-cancer population. But we'll just say, you know, as women, we know that exercise is important in activities. Anybody want to share what they do? Okay. And, and how long? What, what, what's your routine? Oh, good. So you do more than one, um, more than one bout of exercise. And how long does it take you? Because remember, we're doing time and intensity. Awesome. And then you did it. Uh, yeah, because you want to be purposeful in your walking. I know my dog. Oh, what's that? Oh, what's that? You have to stop and wait, right? This uh, it's frustrating. Um, and how many times a week? Usually four to five. Okay, good. Four to five times a week. So twice a day, four to five times a week. Nice. Anybody else? Swim. Swim. How often? Swim. Um, <laughs> three times a week for laps. That's lap swimming. Mm -hmm, okay. Um, three times a week times an hour session hour each session yeah. woohoo and, and a ah and okay and and nice nice quite the, quite the do you go by yourself or do you have a group of friends no i, no, I go by myself okay i, don't feel like I'm hard to I know but at my club they have now they've opened up some um, swimming aerobics what do they call it? Aquatics? Yeah, aqua aerobics. 50, or people, 55 and over. So there's a group forming now at my club. At Lifetime. Good. It's going to be really cool. I just haven't been able to go to any of those yet. So, and that's because I have some joint and hip on work that needs to be replaced. My right foot screwed up. So I need something that's less intense. And I even tried walking the other day with my dog. Just couldn't get it hurts your hips. Yeah. It's just painful. But what I'm impressed with is that you are doing a modification, you're trying something different and still being active. When, when I hurt my back in karate, it was really a mind shift for me. I, I loved the, the intensity. And so I had to really just think through how am I gonna stay active? So then I fell in love with yoga and Pilates and um, you know, it, always walking and biking were my favorites. But um, yeah, you have to really allow your body to say, okay, I'm, I'm not 20 anymore, but what can I do that I still enjoy? Uh, anybody else? I wanted to mention one thing yeah. again before you get off that. Um, I don't know how many of you ladies go to the, the diva class, the exercise classes that are offered. Do you guys go to those? I stopped, I used to. Yeah, I, I did too, and I stopped just because I didn't, I was, in a lot of pain, but those classes are awesome. And I used to do Mia and yoga and Pilates. Yay! Uh, machine, the machine Pilates, and those things cost 
to do a class at my club on the Pilates machines costs like 80 bucks a session or something. It's ridiculous. So to have that for free. I know. Awesome. It's such so a good point. Those three of the classes with the Diva program are really, really good. Strength training class. And the strength the training, training with another one. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Strength training too. So. So let's talk a little bit about the strength training, um, because I absolutely love that we've got this wonderful variety, um, because I think somebody in the back mentioned that they did a weight training class. Yeah. And so, you know, we are taught that we have to put some weight bearing on our muscles and our bones in order to elicit change. Um, but I might venture to say that there's going to be a mind shift in that as well. Because when we think of the other cultures that we follow and learn from, and I alluded to this last week because I said, how many countries have Pilates classes using the reformer? <laughs> none. <laughs> That's a Western, well, of course, not none, because it's we've learned it from other uh, cultures in a lot of ways, but we've really brought it full bright by giving these classes with lots of to- tools and toys. But what I want to just drop the seed in is that if we do weight bearing in activities of daily living and we take out some of the bone thinning activities that we do, would we come out ahead or equal? So so hold on to that thought because I'm going to get to it again. But suffice to say that we are expected to do something that's going to strengthen our bones for a full body experience. And activities of daily living could absolutely do that. Is there any other uh, activities that you can think of that are going to use your upper body? Yes, cooking, uh, ho- housework, right? Gardening. I was so hoping somebody would say gardening. <laughs> I know, because, you know, I think that here's, here's a scenario. The Western culture becomes less and less active, and we start seeing bone thinning. We start seeing immune, immune weakness, and so more and more uh, problems with uh, our immune system, so increase in cancer, increase in obesity. And so then we start thinking, wow, we better do something, so let's do more organized work. And let's get some calcium supplements in there and some supplements for vitamins and minerals. And if we looked at our diet, what if it was because of the sodium and the caffeine and the protein excess that was pulling down our immune system and our bones? I'm just saying what if, because again, I don't have the answers, but I'm learning that this is an interesting perspective that could truly be another game changer for the health and wellness industry. And the dietitians that I meet that are younger and, you know, kind of up and up of uh, all the latest research, just like us now, thank you very much. Um, And they are too learning that you need less protein. You got to be careful of sodium, not because of necessarily of hypertension, but because of how it changes the acidity level of our body and causes the amino acids as well as the calcium to change and therefore decrease our bone density. And so it's an interesting thought and I want us to keep studying it. Um, Anything else we wanna put on here? Gardening, cooking, because I mean, we know that certainly lifting and scrubbing and reaching, all of those things are gonna absolutely put strain on our body. And some people will say, yeah, Suzanne, but that's not enough, right? I'm supposed to get my hour. Uh, I've gotta do my 10,000 steps. And sometimes we get so tied into um, the the rules and regulations that we miss the forest for the trees. And there's uh, one more little study I want to sh- share with you. Let me see if I can pop it open here. Um, it never likes my face when I have on the mask. I wonder why. It doesn't recognize me. <laughs> Let me get to this one. And I think I'm going to go over one fitness... There was a really good little article. Let me see if I can go back to this one. Um, this lady's talking about her personal story 
And she's really just sharing. Let's see if I can get the call back. Articles. Yeah, phooey, it's already gone. Well, I won't take the time to find it. Um, this lady is describing her personal story about um, being shown as a great role model on Shape Magazine. And she uh, exercised like crazy, lost a lot of weight, and then couldn't keep it off. She couldn't sustain it. She said she was just burning herself out on exercise, and she kept gradually gaining weight doing the same amount or more of exercise mm -hmm. and gradually going up. And she would go to her physician and the doctor said, you know what, sorry, you're getting kind of old. That happens. And um, she was like, darn, I don't want that to be the case. So um, she gained all the weight back that, you know, Shape Magazine was touting her and, uh, as being a big success story. And I'm telling you, this has happened when I worked with HEB and the Slim Down Showdown teams. They had this wonderful success, but it wasn't sustainable because... We put them on a low calorie diet and we tell them to exercise a lot. What do you think that does to their immune system and their neurochemistry? It's not sustainable. It's that white knuckle. I'm gonna keep pushing, pushing, pushing and it gradually has diminishing returns. So this lady um, couldn't figure out what to do and she decided to do this Colin Campbell uh, uh, plant-based diet and she saw it turn around. She decreased her exercise a ton. Instead of doing, um, I think it was 12 hours a week. She did, you know, that's, that's a lot, right? That's like at least a couple of days or it's two hours. Um, she went down to just walking 45 minutes a day with her dog and, uh, yoga a few times a week. She lost weight. She of course did give up animal protein, but she lost weight. Her bone density went right back up and her fat content went down. Of course, that's a, an anecdotal, piece of evidence, but we see more and more like that. And so that's where I think it's kind of exciting. Um, so fact or fiction, the more you exercise, the healthier you are. What do we think the answer is to that? Oh, actually, what, based on your story, <laughs> right. Well, so, right. Sorry. And we might have, you know, in the beginning of our hour, we might have said, well, that's true. If you want to lose weight, you have to exercise more. And yeah, we would have thought, yeah, that's true. The more you exercise, the healthier you are. There's even some folks that, you know, have had COVID, very serious uh, symptoms of COVID that were excessive exercisers, or I can say, you know, really healthy. And so we can't make a blanket statement that the more you do, the healthier you are. And that's, that's where I want us to take away. So then the next question will be, well, what would that look like? How do I need to improve? Where am I personally? And that's where I want us to kind of talk about, you know, if, if you aren't doing any exercise, do we need to jump to an hour's worth that, you know, does something from all these categories? And that answer would be definitely no. The rules and regulations um, are really what causes us to have the diminishing returns of exercise. Because they'll say, well, you know, you have to do more and more and more and you have to eat this amount and creating that gap of calorie demand and calorie intake is going to allow you to lose weight. And obviously you've failed because you haven't lost your weight. You're right. And so the personal trainers and the, and the dietitians at the fitness centers would kind of look at you and go, well, it's not my fault. You're not losing weight. I got all the numbers. The numbers tell the story. And the person would say, I'm so defeated because I'm doing what you tell me. Now, of course, time could also be a factor. We have to wait for those 300 calories to add up. You know, every day you've had a deficit. But the reality is we could do it a lot simpler. And so what I propose is a little more of a holistic approach. We've, we've determined that it's not just uh, calories burned in exercise. What else is going to help us in our wellness paradigm? So to equal wellness, we know we need plenty of good sleep. How many hours of sleep is good? How many of us get eight or ten? I know, because some of us say, Suzanne, really? I mean, with the decrease in, in hormones, I'm lucky if I get five hours of sleep because I can't sleep. Now, what would be the, the antidote to that? What do you think I would say? 
<laughs> Maybe, sure. Take a nap. Sleep on times where your body isn't so rigorous. I have to go to bed at nine. Ugh. Go to sleep, you know, and force yourself. No. So a little more easy going on those edges, sure. But we know that there are ways to improve sleep. We know that exercise time of the day sometimes helps to sleep. Um, exercise improves sleep. We know that the type of food you eat it could be, right? Have you ever had a, a day, maybe it's even like the holidays that we just got out of, where you've overeaten and you feel so uncomfortable? You just can't sleep. You've got burning or you've got symptoms. Yeah, that will hurt your sleep. What about good sleep hygiene? What do I mean by that? A dark room. Quiet. Yes, yes. Dark, quiet. What else? Yes, cold. So these last few weeks, or I don't know if it's been three weeks, but it's definitely been two, where we've had nice cold weather, and I'm like, okay, honey, we're opening the windows. He's like, what? <laughs> no, open the windows because it feels so good to snuggle in bed. So the contrast in temperature. <laughs> yeah. Um, so ultimately, Rachel, being warm helps you to sleep. But if you're too warm, now what we're, we're going to do, kick those covers off and it'll wake us up. So sleep hygiene means creating an environment. The other thing is our happy hormones. So this is, again, something that our culture doesn't teach very well, but other cultures do. So where you find joy and, and safety will help in your wellness paradigm. So spiritual connection um, great music, worship music, or just anything that's going to bring your joy down into your soul rather than trying to follow the rules and regulations of what I have to do because that intensity is the opposite, right? It's making us feel rigid. So we know that calories burned in exercise, a little bit of it, sleep would also help us in our wellness paradigm. Social connection. Intellectual. Stimulation. When you have purpose and you're learning, your brain goes through this wonderful wave of active, all those neurochemistry connections that really help our brain get active and happy helps us with our relaxation and the neurochemistry that helps our immune system and our overall wellness. So when you look at it, exercise is really just one of many. I mean, we could, we could list more, right? Um, but intellectual and social connectedness, good quality sleep and exercise. The other one I like to say is being outdoors. There's something magical. You can take pills to help you sleep, but the most powerful way to help you relax is to get stimulation from the sunlight. So now we're talking bone strength. We're talking good physiology. Remember when we talked about um, some of the digestion problems and the gut health? If we get vitamin D from a pill, there's no promises. If we get vitamin D activated in our skin, now it's going to have a great impact on our kidney and our liver and our pancreas, not to mention our gut health. So outdoors, getting sunshine and getting cool temperatures are both really important. We, um, we have this little pup. I want to make sure I'm almost out of time. This little Australian shepherd, and we, we drove all the way to Missouri to pick up this dog. And it's so funny because we actually thought it was going to be a... Um, not not an Australian Shepherd. We thought it was going to be a different breed. Now I'm forgetting what it's called, like a Collie. Um, and we got there and we thought, is that the one we thought we were getting? Nope, that's not it. Well, dang, we drove all the way to Missouri. We're taking this dog. And it was a good friend of my husband's daughter. And, and it's been so much fun. But the, the story is I'd never been to Missouri. And it was so fun to go, drive through this, um, you know, kind of country land. And we, we stopped and we talked with a farmer. And he's like, oh, we're so lucky to get some really cold temperatures because the cold does so much for resetting the, the soil. And I thought, you know, that's just like humans. 
We love it when there's a temperature change, don't we? It does something to our internal just homeostasis. We love it to be cold and yeah, we love it to be hot too. But if we don't get a nice snap of cold weather, we feel cheated, don't we? And that's because it does something miraculous to our immune system and to our overall feeling of wellness. And so the point of the story is exercise is just one little piece of the puzzle. And while it is super important because we can touch on lots of other paradigms of our wellness when we do get out and exercise. So now I'm a little bit less likely to go into a gym and lift heavy things, even though I spent years doing that. Maybe, you know, I, I would have thought differently if I didn't have a broken spine. I might have still been in karate. Who knows? But it really has brought me so much joy to get back into the outside and be able to breathe big and have hot and cold temperatures and to get vitamin D also to be able to modulate my appetite without doing high intensity exercise and the whole culture around the formal exercise that sometimes leads into, you know, well, now that you've exercised, you better go get your protein shake and your supplements because if you don't do that, you're not going to have any benefit from the exercise that you just did. And now we know that's not true. Okay. Any questions for me? Oh, I'm so glad. Well, you can tell this is a topic I love. You know, it's so funny when people say, well, Suzanne the Baker, and I'm like, oh, that is not me. I, I'm a food scientist. You better believe it. But really what I love is to be outside running and playing and um, using my body. And as, you know, I age, I have to do it differently. So, yeah, I'm going to do a little more weightlifting in the kitchen. Um, I love my cast iron pots because it reminds me that I get to lift something heavy. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about that yesterday when the only big pot I have is cast iron and I have it on a big shelf and I think, oh, yay, come on, biceps. Let me do a couple squats while I'm at it. <laughs> um, but those activities are really what keeps us intellectually strong as well as we feel like we're functioning and we're doing something with our, with our energy. So thank you so much for your time. Oh,